and revisit these videos. All right, I think we are ready to begin. So I wanna welcome you back to part four of project-based learning. Assessment and assessment fog is going to be our focus. This is really an exciting topic. I know it's a topic that several of you have been asking about through the last webinars. And so we are now here and we're going to be exploring that. But to begin, what I'd like you to do is to answer this question. How do you know if someone is listening to you? What can you observe as evidence? So when, when you're talking to someone, how do you know they're listening? What is it, what evidence, what do they show you that's evidence that they are paying attention? Let's take about 10 seconds to reflect on this and then please post your answers either in the YouTube Live or in WhatsApp. Your 10 seconds begins now. When you're ready, feel free to post your thoughts in the chat. How do you know if someone is listening to you? What is the evidence? So yeah, asking a sudden question, you know, could could be could could definitely be a way to like test it. But what how can you know this without saying anything? What can you observe that is um, concrete and observable? Uh, eye contact, body language, yes, definitely. So let's go deeper into that. You know, eye contact, yes. But what is, what do you, what do we mean by body language? So I see someone post positive body language. Uh, so what does positive body language mean? I, that, that you're on the right track, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, that, let's see, eye contact students taking notes and being attentive, okay. So making eye contact, taking notes, that's a very concrete piece. Uh, being attentive. I'd like a little bit more detail on what that looks like, like how we know they're being attentive to us and not just about some other random topic unrelated to school. Questioning about his or her opinion regarding what I'm talking about. So you hear that response. Okay, I see body language again. So for example, I think body language, um, one way to be an example of being more specific is that they are what I call body face forward. So their body, their frame, the frame is like focus on directly to you, you know, uh, along with, you know, we talk about eye contact, you know, they're looking, looking directly at you or in your direction, you know, in some cultures, uh, students may not be comfortable to make eye contact, but you know that they're, like, they're gonna be looking at your neck, for example, but they're looking towards you. Uh, so that would be definitely, oh, I like, okay, great. Like nodding, nodding, yes, yes. Exactly. That's those are the specifics um, uh, for that. You know, you know, posture is directed to you. I love that. Yes, that those are the concrete observing. Notice how we're getting more specific because if we just said, you know, it's good body language. Well, what what does that mean? You know, good could mean something different to each person. So we want to be really concrete um, about that. Uh, so I ask this, thank you. This is, the, these are great shares that you're all doing. And I ask this of you because when, as we move forward, you know, about assessment, that's the theme we want to be, we have is to be clear and concise in our communications uh, with our students. So here are our norms, everyone contributing deep into everyone's learning. So, you know, share your ideas, especially as we explore this I mean, assessment. Pay attention to self and others. Sometimes the topics that are talked about in assessment can be uncomfortable in the direction that they go. As we reflect on our own practice, hopefully we're going to see some really strong positive things. And, we, and we're likely also to see some things that we may want to question when this webinar is done, go back and look and think about and verify. Uh, listen intently with one's whole self. So it's not just what I'm going to be talking about and sharing. It's also going to be what you're going to see in the chat as people are sharing. Dina, yes, I like that. Facial expressions, especially when I explain and talk to them and give examples. So you're looking at those facial expressions uh, and asking questions. You know, 
please ask questions. It's not some questions will be for clarification. Other questions would be for inquiry or to to learn more, to get more context before forming a decision. So those those are things we want to remember as we move forward. Here's our driving question. How do we engage students in real world explorations through project based learning? And again, as you know, I'm John McCarthy and I am supporting you on this journey. And I just want to remind you that as you have questions, you know, throughout the week, in after we have our, our last webinar in on Wednesday, just a couple of days. After that, you're going to have a lot of time where you can ask for uh, support, either questions in the general community of our WhatsApp group. If you put it there, that way it's an opportunity for others to respond and support each other. But you can also private message me as well uh, through WhatsApp, and I'll be happy to answer your questions as you're working through this, this journey. So let's review a few things that we looked at uh, during our last session, because they do tie to some extent into today's focus about assessment. We talked about call to actions. How do we engage students? How do we launch our PBL unit? And how do we sustain interest and engagement? And it begins with having that opening piece, which is you know a driving question or a challenge statement. Uh, it may be formed around an inquiry or study or mystery question. Now, I know some of you in the original first document you worked on, when you crafted your driving question or your statement, some crafted a statement, and, and which is fine, although the statement has to have a call to action vibe to it. And a way to do that is look at your statement and ask yourself, is there a so what? You know, if I say project-based learning, or, or you know, if I say real life learning experiences empower students' engagement, all right, nice statement, but so what? The so what is, so if, if that is true or if students agree to that, what are they gonna do with it or about it? So, so then I might change it and say, you know, uh, you know, real world learning experiences are empowering to students and uh, their, their charge is to find new ways to show teachers how to do that. All right, now we have a so what. So look at your your questions or your statements you came up to lead your project and ask yourself, is there a so what? You know, so what are we going to do about that? And so we looked at driving questions and we talked about these four characteristics or that we want. You know, it should be open-ended, there should be sustained inquiry throughout based on the content. So throughout the entire unit. You should engage students through context, which means connecting the academics to the world that students are familiar with so that they can build understanding and see value. And then should relate to a real world problem, need or opportunity, which is going to engage students to actively participate because we're giving them a voice into the community, into the adult world. Entry events should be engaging. How we launch this is something that creates a, a positive, constructive emotion. You know, we want them to be excited and we want them to see purpose and value. Maybe there's a concern that we're looking at. You know, maybe it's water quality or it's air quality. There's, there's some issue. We want them to be concerned. And, and so excitement might be more, more low key or low powered, but it's still there. You know, they, they want to be a part of this. And there's different ways we can start entry events. And we have a variety of options here. The one I really want to highlight is the guest speaker. You know, having someone who represents your audience talk to the students, you know, through some type of virtual uh, meeting, whether it's Zoom or Google Meets or some other tool, uh, we want them to be able to, to use that and use it effectively. <clears throat> Because when they when they we use those tools, it makes the guests more accessible for our students to uh, listen and talk to, uh, and and have that engagement. And we had some examples. I talked about you know there's one called the sneeze. If you if you search that on YouTube, you're going to find this one that you know creates conversation when they watch the video around a topic such as how. 
how diseases get spread or how viruses can be spread. So what new or important PBL idea will you spend time on including in your unit lesson based upon that review of ideas? Take 10 seconds to reflect, and then when you're ready, please post your answer. Yeah, the, the collaboration is working towards the authentic audience that they're, and they need a face to that audience. They need to see who they're, who they're working with. And seeing, you know, it may not be a person, it may be a logo of a company or an organization, or it could be a picture of someone, you know, whether alive or just letting them know this is who we're working for. Uh, call to action, yes, very important. Um, so let's see, what, what I'm looking for, you know, so, you know, can I elaborate more on the question? I'm just, based on what I just showed you, when we review what we did in our last webinar, what idea there stands out to you is, this is something I'm, I'm looking to spend more time on, whether it's my call to action, my driving question, or maybe it's my entry event. Yeah, yeah, so PBL and the challenges of COVID-19, that's a great opportunity for a project idea for students to look at and think about what are best practices or you know, do awareness or advocacy around that. Um, you know, it gets students involved so we can, we can teach the curriculum and becomes the curriculum becomes an important need to know because students have to understand so that they can craft their ideas for their product or presentation. And so we can interweave the, uh, the ideas of the content that we're teaching with a thematic conversation about the, the bigger PBL topic. And that's what makes it so powerful. And when we talk about management, we're going to get into that idea of how do we weave content with the theme of the project that we're working on. All right, good, good ideas. So let's let's dive into assessment because that's always a, a big question, a thing to explore. And one of the first questions we need to address that comes up is, all right, so I'm doing a PBL unit. You know, what kind of assessments can I use? What what can I apply with with my students? And so when we look at assessments, particularly traditional assessments. If you have assessments that you find are very successful in accurately collecting data about your students, you're going to continue to use them. Those assessments will still continue to be used in project-based learning units because they're a way to collect data on how on what your students have, have learned and, and what they still need to learn, uh, as, as well as just to, just to track that the growth is happening. Now the assessments need to be clean and we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that. Uh, but these traditional assessments are still a part of what PBL is about. Let's see, well, one would choose a proper PBL where students would show advocacy for their ideas and um, about guiding certain projects. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It gives, it gives students that voice. So this is the first thing to always keep in mind is if you ask me the question, what assessments I should I use in PBL? My first question to you is gonna be, in a high quality traditional unit that you teach, what are good quality assessments you currently use? <clears throat> and you'll be able to answer that because you know which ones work and, and when they work or how they have to be structured to work effectively. And you're gonna to continue to do that with, with your students. Now, the thing is, it's very important, you know, that we are doing informative assessments, that we're looking at, you know, checkpoints, you know, both daily and weekly to track growth, because the last thing that you want to have happen is that for a student to, well, for you to go like a week and a half or two weeks or three weeks, and then discover there's a group of your students who didn't understand the core concepts introduced in the first week. Uh, we want to know that so as teachers, we can address that. That's true in a project. That's true in a traditional unit. So you're going to want those, those opportunities to do those academic, what I call checkpoints uh, and the informative check-ins where you might have 
uh, for example, in the virtual world, you might do office hours or, you know, where you meet with students in small groups or individually, or if you're, if you're teaching live online, you know, you might use breakout rooms uh, and put students into breakout rooms where you've grouped them so that you can work with groups uh, and, and provide support that they need based upon your data collection. So there's lots of ways that we can address this. But let's look at this example. Here's an assignment. And in this assignment, what you're gonna see is, this is an actual assignment that was done. It was a social studies assignment, I believe it was, it was fourth grade. And what the task asks is for the students to do three things. They need to identify, they have to label the, st the states, they have to label certain cities, and they have to label uh, certain bodies of water. So that's what they had to do. Now the students, now in this particular assignment that was graded, this student received an 80%. You know, and you can see that says B minus. So they got 80%. So my question for you is when you hear or know or are told that a student got an 80%, a B minus, what does that say to you? What's your assessment just on just on that information alone? about the understanding and learning that the student has. What level of learning would you say that student has? So just wanted to give you that time to think about that and you know, some people, some people will say, well, you know, B minus, that means that they know most of, of, of the work, you know, have a pretty strong understanding, they're good to go. There might be some minor gaps, though. There might be some tweaks, because, I mean, it's, it's a B minus after all. There's, it's 80%. There's 20% that, that's a gap. So where's the gap? What is it? So you'd want to look more closely at the list. You'd want to see where where's the missing understanding so that you can provide that support um, and what you would discover is that the content basically the question the, the academic questions that are being asked in those three areas so what states label the states label the cities label the um the different geographical locations are all done correctly and accurately. So they have a, so it's a hundred percent, as far as the content, as far as the academic knowledge, it's a hundred percent. So then the question we need to ask ourselves now is, okay, wait, the student got a B minus 80%, but they have a hundred percent accuracy for the academic tasks. So where are they lacking? Why did they lose the points? Yeah, I like the point, like when you, when you hear 80%, you say they know the core ideas, but lack authenticity or incomplete data representation. I mean, that, that's a good possibility. And then when we, when we realize that's not the case, that they have 100% accuracy, then what is the gap? Well, the gap, when you look at this, is that points were taken off for two reasons. One, they lost the, the student lost points because of misspellings. And secondly, this student lost points because they didn't label the titles with the correct color. As you see, the states are supposed to be labeled in red. The cities are supposed to be labeled in green and the land formations are supposed to be labeled in black. The student didn't do that. And so as a result, this student lost all these points. And, and so when we, we look at this, you know, they lose all these points, then we have to you know, ask ourselves, you know, what does this mean? And in this case, the, this is what we call assessment fog because if, this, if you were to go to the student based upon the 80% score, which means there's gap in learning, and you told them they had to do a review, 
of those gaps that you know you want them to like redo this for example they'd be confused i mean why have to redo something they already demonstrated accuracy for and so as a result of that you know that that's a waste of their time and it's also a waste of time for the teacher because the teacher's now spending extra time trying to address this 20 percent gap that does not exist uh, now, some of you might say, well, they didn't follow the rules. You know, rules, following the rules, following directions is important. And it definitely is an important skill. And I, I, I don't agree with you. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you that, you know, you, you'd want to teach and coach them about following directions. And, and maybe you want to do points for that. But those points should not be part of the academic grade because the academic grade is what we count on to determine what are the needs, the academic needs of our students and mixing in non-academic content, you know, this is what creates assessment fog. And that's something we want to avoid because if we can't measure it because there's extra things being thrown in that don't matter to the topic uh, or the focus of the content, then that creates issues. So, you know, I, I see some things like they didn't, they didn't pay attention completely and, you know, re relation with real life. Well, yeah, in, in real life, you know, there are times if you don't follow directions, you know, there are consequences. However, if you look at this, the student did follow directions in terms of answering the questions, you know, they just didn't use the correct color. And that color is just a logistical request. It's not an academic request. So when we are talking about this whole idea, you know, when we put st students, for example, when we, when we look at assessment, it's very important, whether it's project-based learning or traditional unit, that all academic assessments be individual. So what that means is there should be no group grade. I mean, think about it. You know, when you have a group of students working on a product, you know, based upon the skill sets in your in the disciplines that you teach, and let's say it's a group of four students, and, you know, so there are times where two of the students aren't doing any of the work or doing very little of work, and of the other two students, one might doing be doing more work or more better quality work than the other, and let's say between that one, those two two students, especially that one student who's doing a lot of effort because they don't want their grade to suffer, they do all this work, which they clearly have a better understanding of the content. And yet, and let's say the work results in an A, a, a high score, 95%. Then if we do a group grade, that means even the students who did little to no work will get that A. And that creates the impression that those students who did little or no work actually mastered those skills, but they didn't because they didn't do the work. They didn't you know, participate. They didn't work through the ideas. And yet they're getting the grade based upon the work and efforts of other people. And that's assessment fog. So every academic grade should be individual. There should be no group grade for academics. Now you can do it for global professional skills like teaching collaboration, communication, following directions. You, you can do group, you know, group grades based upon that. And there's different ways of doing that, but not for the academic. You know, when students are working in teams, think of them as study teams or learning teams, professional learning teams where they're exploring, gathering information and shaping, you know, the content to, to build each other's understanding so that they can take that content that the group has been collecting and looking at and talking about and then shape their own individual uh, artifacts or products to demonstrate their understanding. You know, or if they're gonna create one prototype as a group, then they still have, indiv they have the individual assessments, both traditional and non-traditional that they can take individually, which is gonna tell you what they know and what they don't know. Because in assessment, that is really what we need to understand is for every student, what do they know and what do they don't know? And you cannot 
identify that when students are working, when, or not, not when they're working as a group, but when they are assessed as a group. So, yeah, it, so it's very important that there are, again, there are no group grades when it comes to your academic content. And this is particularly true, what's well, true in every case, but when you're doing project-based learning where you have students working in a lot of different groups, it's important that they are assessed individually. Otherwise, this is why kids, you know, your advanced learners don't like to work in groups because they figure they're gonna to have to do most of the work. And in many cases, that is what happens. And they don't want that. They'd rather just work on their own and get credit for what they do than to have someone else you know, take credit for what they did. So again, we emphasize no group grades when it comes to, when it comes to academic assessments. So when we think about this, this is a little bit of a busy chart. Um, this is to give you an example, uh, a demonstration of this. So let's let's take the presentations that we do. Now, let me begin by saying presentations are very good because they give students the opportunity to practice communication skills and, and how to present and how to collaborate. Uh, where the, and, and so when you look at the, it, the, on the left-hand side, you'll see, you know, this is what usually happens is that the divide uh, when usually it's like, let's say it's a group of four, they're gonna divide into four parts, the presentation information or, this, or this, the presentation segments. And so each person is taking a quarter, at best, a quarter of the content to be part of their turn when they present. So when we think about that, we have to ask realistically, how do we assess those students for the other three parts, the 75% that they're not even talking about? How do you even know? what they understood, that individual. Are, are you going to assume because every student talks about all the parts that every student actually took the time to focus on all the parts? Uh, you know, those, those are things don't necessarily happen. Let's see, we could assign group leaders who delegate tasks during the project to ensure good assessment of the individual effort. So, okay, I, the, at first, when you first wrote this, the first problem, like, oh boy. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. You might have what's called a project manager uh, and their job is to keep track of the tasks being accomplished, making sure everyone's not only doing their part, but facilitating the, the group conversation to review everyone's parts, so everyone's hearing about it and thinking about it in preparations for their individual assessments. As long as there's an individual assessment and not a group grade, that example you give is excellent. So I talk about here in the slides, so A, divide into four parts. That, that's what usually happens in the presentation, they divvy it up, which is normal, that's natural, there's nothing wrong with that. And then, you know, each person is usually responsible for their part. So they usually, you know, theoretically will know their part deeply but you have no indication that they really know uh, to the same depth or, or even at all the other components. Now, the other thing is usually these presentations go about 10 minutes. On average, they're, they're a 10 minute presentation, sometimes even shorter, but let's assume it's 10 minutes. And so each person has two minutes and 15 seconds. So it gives them a 15 second transition to speak. How are they gonna demonstrate mastery or competency of their own part in that time, much less all four parts when they're not talking about that? How, how, how are they gonna do that? It's incredibly difficult and rare for that to be able to happen. I mean, it's not to say there aren't ways you can't, you can't include presentation as part of the assessment. It just shouldn't be the whole assessment. It shouldn't be focusing on everything or focusing on uh, if it's focused on if it's focused on something where each person takes a turn and gives their own perspective about the same concept, yeah, then you can you could probably assess that. But if they're breaking it up into components, then not so much. And that's the challenge. You know, that's just one example because we we do a lot of presentations. And again, there's value in presentations. Students get practice in public speaking, especially if they're speaking to a live or authentic audience. Those are powerful experiences that we need our students to have to become better in the global professional skills, which is a, a big strength of project-based learning. And it goes back to our first uh, webinar when we looked at the reason why, you know, colleges and employers, you know, are looking for these skill sets that 
we need to incorporate. When it comes to academic assessment, however, we have to do a cleaner job of what we're doing. So before we continue along those lines, where could you look for assessment fog in your lessons and assessments? You know, where might you begin to look and say, hmm, maybe, you know, when we do this final product or this presentation, maybe I need to go back and look and say, I need to make some changes. I need to rethink. It's like, for example, if you, a solution for presentations is you have the presentation and you have a traditional assessment either beforehand to prepare students for the their presentations or afterwards so that the presentations become a review for everybody of the content they're going to be assessed on in the traditional assessment. So that's one example. All right, I'm going to give you a moment, reflect, take 10 seconds, reflect, and then just respond to this question. Where could you look for assessment fog, areas that need to be cleaned up in your lessons and assessments? When you're ready, post in the chat. Now, these are these are difficult, uh, can be a difficult topic to, to be thinking about assessment fog, because uh, it can challenge some of our notions about how we do practice or even cause us to reflect and think back and say, hmm, have I done this? Because I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to admit, as I look through my teaching career, I've, I've had assessment fog. I think everyone has assessment fog in what they do, it's just a matter of how we go back and look and, and look to clean it, like clean it up. So yeah, you know, when students don't show full mastery of the whole project, aspects only excel at, at certain parts. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing, that's why we have, you know, traditional assessments in a PBL unit. We're going to be assessing throughout. If it's a four week unit, we're gonna be doing assessments probably every week uh, to track growth. We don't need or want the final product to try to compo compile or hold all the different uh, standards and skills that we're trying to teach, but rather, you know, those standards, those skills are being developed and, and, and layered in complexity throughout those four weeks. And we're doing assessments to see how students are progressing and growing. So by the time they get to that product, some of those skills have already been assessed and, and are maybe expected to be used at a higher level by the time we get to using it for the final product or presentation or proposal. Okay, so you know, feel free to post as you're ready. And let's just kind of look at this. How do we clean up assessment fog? Well, the first thing is we need to separate the, the academic requirements or criteria from the logistics. And so when we, when we look at this, now on the academic side, this is what we want to evaluate for academic growth in our subject areas and the course we're teaching. And, and so this, this, this part's really important because we don't want to be giving points or taking away points for logistics. I mean, there are situations where students who have, you know, double space, you know, typed, you know, they follow those logistical requirements, but they don't have as much of the academic who sometimes get, get more points on the logistics side that creates assessment fog about what they truly know about academics. So they might get an 80%, and the reality is that actually their content knowledge is at a 40%, but they did all the other things right and they got points for it. Believe me, I've seen rubrics and checklists that give points or take away points based upon what's on the logistics side. And there should be no points given or taken away on the logistical side, it should only be on the academic. Now you say, well, if I, what happens if, if I don't take points away, if they don't, if they don't type it, well, instead of taking points away because they didn't type it, just give it back to them and say, type it, you know, or have them work, you know, type, work in your classroom or while you're doing teaching virtually. I mean, there's no reason why they can't type it and then have them do that. Now, yes, it's late. And this, <laughs> I'm just going to share my perspective. I'm not the only perspective on this, 
But I would say that, you know, if we take out points because it's late, we're creating assessment fog because we need to know where they are academically. Now, if you have a separate column where you keep track of following directions or call it professionalism, which is separate from the academic grade, it's just a, a, a way to track their growth and give them feedback, then by all means do that. And there's schools that actually do that where they have separate categories that that are non-academic based, but are important for teaching students those life skills, those professional skills we want them to use. Uh, they're just not mixed into the academic side because that we cannot afford to create that assessment fog. Um, and okay, so and I, I would, let me read this whole, the IQ of students may be reasons for fog also delaying homeworks so they didn't actually, they didn't study daily. Um, so definitely, you know, if, where a student's skill level is uh, may impact their, their rate of growth. Assessment fog is actually uh, occurs because of the teacher. The students ha do not create assessment fog. Let me be very clear. A students have no role in creating assessment fog. They just have to endure it. Assessment fog is based upon the planning and structures that an educator has, whether it's a teacher or the curriculum director who, you know, or the committee that maps out uh, what's being assessed and how it's being assessed. That's where assessment fog happens. Uh, and, and so that's just really important to note. Now, what you bring up is more of a question about differentiation and how we need to meet the needs of all learners who may not, who learn at different rates and paces. And that's a whole different um, conversation uh, we could have on that. Uh, but in terms of assessment fog, it's what the teacher is doing. So if I'm taking points off or giving points for logistics, or if I'm giving extra credit because someone you know, did some extra work, that's assessment fog. You know, if I give points because of their participation in the academic grade, then I'm creating I'm a fog of what they really know or don't know on the core concepts. And again, I, I'm not telling you how best I'm not telling you how you need to handle it. I'm just saying, let's just be aware of what it is. Let's, let's be honest with what we have, that if we are giving or taking points away for logistics, it creates assessment fog. Uh, and there are solutions and there are ways to document and record you know, what students are doing logistically that we expect them to develop. Uh, we just need to make sure it's kept separate from the academics. So when we think about criteria, so let's talk about assessment criteria. Assessment criteria is based upon those qualitative expectations, not quantitative expectations. There's a difference, as you know. Qualitative is based upon your standards. Quantitative is based upon how much stuff they're doing. How much stuff they do is more of a logistics than it is a academic criteria. And so it's those qualitative expectations uh, along with formative feedback checkpoints. So when you do those formative feedback checkpoints, you're checking to see the quality of students understanding knowledge, comprehension, application, and up to synthesizing their ideas. And that's what we want. So we have to be very clear and clean about that. So we look at this again, let's look at the you know, ideas about presentation. And so on the side, the A side, the left side, are, quali uh, are qualitative, uh, you know, criteria for a good presentation on the content. So, you know, let's not say, assume this is not a speech class, this is a science class, a math class, English class, social studies class, a foreign language class. And during that class, what is it, you know, when they're presenting, what is it you need to know that they understand? Well, you see right here, address, addresses and explains each core concept. Accurately contrast the point of view. Well, you can't accurately contrast something unless you know the content, you know the information. Uses accurate evidence to support ideas. Slide text and images act you know, are accurate and reflect the synthesis of the information. So the text and images supports the thinking of the academic ideas. Those are all qualitative 
assessment checkpoints. On the other side, we have logistics. You know, we want them to dress professionally, we want to speak without notes, we want to show enthusiasm, be well prepared and know their content. Know their content and say, well, wait, isn't that academic? Well, that's a general statement. What does know your content mean? Well, on A side, number one, and number two, really get to that. Actually, number one, number three, address and explain to each core concept that uses accurate evidence to support ideas. That's how you know your content, if you can do that. But the logistics side is oftentimes some of these things we take and we include in our rubric and our checklist, and we grade those. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. You could absolutely put that in your rubric. Just don't count those points to their academic grade. Because I, I could dress, I could do everything on the B side, dress professionally, speak without notes, show enthusiasm, be, you know, show them well prepared. You know, and I know the content that I share, but the content doesn't really go into show depth or connections, you know, that one in three are asking for. And I could get a higher grade on this presentation than someone who is strong on the A side, but does nothing on the B side. So again, we can have both. You can assess both, just keep them separate. And then make sure that your acad academic grade is based upon your academic piece, which is probably gonna be the course grade, which means in many cases, the logistics grade, if you wanna call it that, uh, is for coaching and direction to help them grow. So this, this is what we really want to do. We want to focus on that pre the checklist that's an academic language and focus on students demonstrating their learning and being and being we, we need to be very specific, as you can see here. Because remember, remember at the very beginning of this webinar, I asked you the question of when someone, when you're talking, how do you know? If someone's listening, scroll back in the chat and go look at your comments. Go look at the word choice and ask yourself, was if I went by this description, which, which of these, because some are, are, are very helpful, which of the word choice uh, is much is specific and observable that I could actually accurately assess and give feedback on a person's ability to be a good listener. And you're gonna find there, all the language was good, all the ideas were good ideas. It's just some ideas were more specific and concrete and could be used as assessment criteria than others. And we have to make sure we do this with our academic, identify the logistical language and pull it out. So let's look at this example, just to give an example of qualitative versus quantitative. You know, there are rubrics that use this type of language, you know, that, you know, includes one or more, one or no images, includes two, includes three, includes four or more. And it doesn't have to be images, it could be other things. And, and so this, this type of language technically means that let's say, let's say this is about, Oh, like the I suggested about COVID-19. Let's say this is about a presentation on COVID-19 and how to, you know, exp you know, explain the how viruses are transmitted, you know, to affect the body. And could a student include four or more pictures that have nothing to do with the presentation? Could they do that? Absolutely. And you'd have to give them a four because based on this language, they fulfilled your requirements. And we see that that happens all the time. You know, must have at least four images in your presentation. And you look at the images, you're like, how does this relate? And if they do relate, how strongly do they relate? What I mean by that, here's a better rubric. Look at this. So you have images may be present. Some images may be present enough images are present. Now that, that's subjective. I'll give you that, that part's subjective. And what I would do in my logistical criteria, which is not part of this, would be you need to have three to four pictures. Now, the key to this is what's in the red. So two, some images may be present to support the message. Okay, that's a good start, but it's still a little vague until you read the next part. Other images do not 
or they are insufficient images. So it's saying right there, there are some images might support, but there's images in there that do, do not support. So it's, it's, it's not as good as it could be. At standard, enough images are present and advance the message. Now keep in mind, I said, I'd have a separate a logistical checklist of these are things you need to prepare for your presentation. And one would be, you need three to four images. So I'm looking for three images. That would be enough. Now, of those images I need to address are the images, you know, a better use than number two, which is images act as supporting illustrations or details to the message. So if you get three images, but they don't support, then you're not gonna get a three. Maybe you have four images and three of them do and one don't, I'll give you the three because you know, minimum was three images to do this and you, you, you were able to do that. And it exceed, in addition to at standard, so in addition to the, you know, that you have, you know, at least three to four images that support, the images can generate understanding and dialogue by representing the message with little or no additional details. So that's, that would be, this is a far more clear rubric for qualitative descriptor than this one. So last, I just want to share with you, this is a rubric about rubrics, and it gives you some language to look at and think about for when you go back and look at your rubrics and say, do I have, how much qualitative language do I have here versus, you know, the quantitative pieces? Uh, how, and, then, and then if I don't have any quantitative, uh, uh, the, for the qualitative, do I have, like it says here, or, you know, criteria, you know, at, you know, and you know, that is, um, you know, each focuses on a key concept or idea versus maybe a long list redundant unrelated to assess standards or a to-do list. You know, does it look like this? Do I have more, con do I provide more context to, to differentiate between the three columns or do I just do this? So, and by the way, this is a separate PDF also in uh, your, your classroom where you can where you go to that folder with all the PDFs of the slide decks, you'll find a one that says rubrics about rubrics and that's this one and you can feel free to use that. So I've, I've shared a lot with you right now about assessment fog and, and I want you to think about what's an area that you want to improve on or get or get better at, and and so I want you to reflect on you know these one of these three areas. You know, are you going to look at academic or logistics? Like, look at your language and say, where do I have logistical requirements I need to separate out of my academic, or do I look at my qualitative versus quantitative language, or look at my rubric descriptions? Do I have a more clarifying language that is, makes things clear and specific? And you know, I want you to just think about that, take about 10, 15 seconds to reflect on what area you want to spend time on and why, and then just post in the chat. And while you do that, I'm gonna look at, let's see the question. Um, do we have to create a new rubric for each project or can we prepare a standard one? You can prepare a standard one. It's, it, it depends, well, in part, it depends on the subject. Uh, and what you're doing. So like, for example, if I'm, if I'm looking at for, for English and I'm working on writing and I'm looking at, you know, use of informational, well, the writing component um, could be hmm, something about the writing component and actually each rubric I do with writing, I'm going to be adding layers of skills. So perhaps the writing would not be an example. If I'm teaching writing skills, I'm going to have a different rubric for that. However, if I, when I'm having students write an informational uh, report or article or a, a persuasive report or article, like I can have a standard rubric for those and even use those rubrics across disciplines. I mean, those are possibilities um, you know, where you might have a standard rubric that you use you know, throughout. Um, but you're also, in every project, you are still gonna have either if you might have a standard rubric and then you might have different what I call criteria checklists <laughs> that really describes um, 
the specific, you, know, you look at your skills and concepts that you're teaching in that particular unit, there are going to be some differences, some very specific things that you're looking for, and you might have a, a criteria checklist for that. But I would start with having, yeah, having a rubric that, um, you know, that you that you can say, oh, I can use this rubric for writing, or I can use this rubric for engineering design or scientific method, you know, the approach I want them to take. And because it's something we're, we're doing throughout and, you know, and having, you know, clear and accurate detail and explanation. And that could be a standard rubric that you use. And then that you can start creating the more customized ones for, for your different projects. So yeah, definitely act, yeah, I see academic over logistics. Just, that's, that, that's a big thing. Look for your logistical language and take it out. Um, I can't tell you how I've, I've seen rubrics where, uh, I remember one rubric I looked at, there was five um, areas in the rubric. And when you looked at the rubric, four of the five areas were all about logistics. You know, all about like have, you know, list, you know, 10 people. Okay, well, I can list 10 people that are not related or not, you know, that don't show any understanding of the content. Uh, you know, be creative. What does that mean? Be creative. I, I, I you know, we, that might be more logistical. I mean, there is a place where being creative is important. There's a way to synthesize ideas and create something new while demonstrating, you know, with clear evidence and support why that new idea is relevant, now you're getting somewhere. Um, so yeah, I would like to spend more time on academic logis logistics, making sure that students know how to represent their way of thinking regarding the concepts, effectively smooth transition between subtopics. Yes, and so the thing I, I, I invite you to do is when you are looking to make changes is one activity you can do is you know, whether in pairs or if you have a larger uh, department or team meeting, is everyone bring in uh, a rubric that you've created and take turns, you know, just sharing it and getting feedback. You know, and the feedback should could be in the language of, I notice, I wonder, and what if. I notice is noticing what's something that's good about what they have. You know, it's always important to know what's working. Then I wonder is when you see something that might be a gap, it's your personal opinion. So you want to present it as I wonder if, you know, asking for, you know, student's name and address is, is should be, should have points connected to it, you know, you know, because that's what they had in their rubric. You know, they might disagree, but you're, you're, you're giving an invitation for them to consider something. You're raising a potential challenge and it's up to the author to decide what they're going to do with that. And then, you know, you can say, what if, what if is when you make suggestions, what if you were to take, you know, the name and address out of that section or, or take the points out so they know it's not for points, but still required for them to do and make that a separate list. You know, I teach, um, I teach graduate classes and when I give students you know, their major papers they have to do, I give them, you know, there's two parts to what I give them. I give them the rubric, you know, this, and it tells them exactly, this is explicitly what I'm going to be assessing and how I'm going to be assessing it so they can look and they know exactly what's going on. And then I have on a separate page, I, I tell them these are, I call them logistical requirements. And essentially I say, you must fulfill these logistical requirements. If you do not, I'm not grading it. I'm giving it back to you. And by the way, when I give it, when I give papers, and I've done this, I give papers back to my grad students. Um, I require them to fix those things and resubmit them. And um, oftentimes they're 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 late. I do not take points off for being late. I don't. That's assessment fog. Now I do have hard deadlines, you know, and end of the course where you know within a certain time, if you don't have it to me. Now at that point, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's incomplete. But you know, I all my they always turn in their papers. So, so yeah, I mean, you can do those things. You can find solutions for you know kids between grades, you know, uh, grades K through twelve, where you provide them supports where they you you're teaching them how to, and holding them responsible for 
uh, you know, making up the work, completing those logistical requirements, and then turning in a clean copy to you. You can teach those habits of minds without taking off points because if you just grade it and take points off, you've let them off the hook. They're like, well, pff, I don't have to do it. You already gave me a grade. Why am I going to do it again? So some final things to think about. Um, this is kind of like a, a prelude to what we're going to be looking at later on, you know, from management, but from an academic perspective, when we're doing assessments, it's really important to give students some type of guide uh, to plan and prepare their work so they can be successful in your assessments. So this is an example because students don't magically know how to necessarily organize their time. And also, especially in virtual instruction, they might really struggle. Some of your students might be struggling uh, getting things done on time. So you might send them something like this, where this is basically, you know, a week's worth of you know, look at weekly week review a little bit more than a week, and it breaks down how much time the teacher thinks it would take to complete it in the second column. And what students do is they have to fill in the first column uh, with what date and time they're going to work on it and gives them a way to organize their time. And then when they finish a, I don't, a row, they check it off in the far right column. Now, it, let's say they check it off and it's not complete. Well, then that's a coaching conversation you can have. This also empowers parents if students are working from home to know where, what their students should be doing and actually empowers them to help them think through and schedule their time. I mean, parents would love you for having something like this because students, even high school students do not magically know how to do this. Some do, and let's stay out of their way if they're turning in work on time and their, their, their way of doing it works just fine for them. We don't make them use this. We introduce it, maybe they wanna use it, maybe they don't, but we don't make them do it. But the ones who are struggling, we have them start to follow this type of structure. You know, another thing we do is we give these checklists. And you know, on first blush, you look at this checklist and it can feel overwhelming. It's like, oh my gosh, there's like eight things here. And there are students who just get frozen because they don't know, they can't start on step one because they keep seeing everything. Now, some students want to see everything, so when they get started, they're good to go. Uh, but what if we do this? We do some type of color coding, and we say, all right, you know, when you're working this checklist, start with the blue. So for students who feel overwhelmed by seeing eight things, you say, don't worry about eight things. Just look at this blue. This is what you need to start with, and it gives them a visual descriptor. You know, if you're doing it in virtual spaces, you might put you know, break this up into three different files and say, here are the three files, start in the first file, complete that, then work on the next file. And for students who want to see everything, they're going to open up all three files and look at that, and that's okay. Um, so we're honoring, you know, all students by giving them different ways that they can approach this. All right. So what questions do you have at this point before we wrap up with today's session? Any last questions? <clears throat> okay. I think that was a pause there. So this will conclude our fourth webinar. This one is assessment. And as I said, the handout is available to you already in Google Classroom. If you're interested in that rubric about rubrics, that's also there as a separate file. And like I said, I'll be using WhatsApp to field any questions you have after this is over. Uh, and I have been posting comments on the assignments turned in, looking at those uh, and giving comments. Now, as we move into the big template, uh, I don't give us comments on every phase of that. Uh, the expectation is that by the end of end of September, is that right? Yeah, um, you, um, everyone, you want you to strive to have your the full template completed, including a rubric, <laughs> including a rubric with that. Now, some of you might need more time, and that's fine. Uh, and just know that you can use WhatsApp either as in the whole group chat, or you can you can contact me independently. Uh, or use my uh, my opening paths email here on the screen, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Just know if you have questions about your template, please include a link to it, to it when you contact me. That way, I can easily click and go. Otherwise, I got to do a whole lot of steps to get there. 
All right. Thank you all. Appreciate you guys being here and spending your time. This has been exciting. And I look forward to seeing your continued growth as well as what you implement for your kids. This is going to be awesome. All right.